they were the Democrats of a very undemocratic age. In our time, when we speak about pirates, we usually think about swaggering buccaneers, you know, those Pirates of the Caribbean movies where sexy Johnny Depp stagger walks along the quay like Keith Richards after a bender. Now, and always when you're making these comparisons, it says more about us than it does about the actual historical era. For pirates in their golden age of the 1700s were extraordinarily democratic. Their ships were crammed with men and women of all kinds of different cultures. Many were former slaves who were given the choice of slavery on shore or freedom at sea, gladly chose to become pirates. Others were indigenous natives. Others were common people escaping a time when many of our foreparents were debt slaves and agricultural serfs. And in our era, when a CEO like Jeff Bezos can bankroll an entire ego-driven private space program while his workers struggle to pay their medical bills, it's worth noting that the pay level between a common sailor and a captain on a pirate ship was only twice as much. However, that pay could be massive. Edward Blackbeard Teach was worth $12 million. Captain John Bowen, a Creole pirate, was worth $40 million. But the greatest of them all was Black Sam Bellamy. And 300 years later, Forbes magazine would estimate that this one coup made Black Sam the richest of all the pirates of all time. And then he sailed into a dark and stormy night off the coast of Cape Cod, and the legends began. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to Crime Ways Podcast. My name is Declan Hill. I'm an associate professor of investigations at the University of New Haven. And each week, I, along with my students, and this week it's Brigitte Harriston and Alexia Miller, we bring you a podcast episode on the best criminal investigators in the world. And this episode is called The Search for Black Sam. And it combines modern day forensic crime techniques and a historical search that spanned countries, continents, and 300 years of history. Our guide is the great Claire Glynn. She is a professor of forensics in the department here at the University of New Haven, but I bring her on because she's one of the best forensic genealogists in the world. Now, forensic genealogy is the science of solving historic cold cases by examining the DNA of living relatives. And Claire has helped resolve cases of murder, sexual assault, and drug dealing. But now, she was going to try to solve a mystery from the golden age of pirates. Good morning, Claire. Uh, thank you so much for coming back and joining us on Crime Ways Podcast. It's fantastic to have you here. Thank you for having me, Declan. Uh, listen, Black Sam Bellamy, the pirate. Tell me all about him. Tell our listeners all about him. Well, Captain Black Sam Bellamy is uh, named as Forbes magazine highest earning pirate of all time. Uh, he amassed a wealth of over $120 million uh, by today's standards, or at least that was it in 2008. So it's probably worth even more now. Um, and Captain Black Sam Bellamy was a young guy from England, from Devon in England. And he actually worked for, he was a sailor for the British Navy for a number of years. Um, and he had actually quite a short uh, career as a pirate. He was only a pirate for about a year. And he was known as the Robin of the Seas, the Robin Hood of the Seas, because he was known quite well for his generosity and his kindness that he showed to his crew members and to other uh, slave ships that he was capturing. Um, and so in... And, and by the way, Claire, I, I want to jump in here because we're going to get right into the very bones of this man. <laughs> so I, I really want our listeners to know 
about Black Sam Bellamy, um, and 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 t what what era are we talking about? I I know I've seen the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, but but roughly what time is this? So this is the 18th century and early in the 1700s. Um, okay. He became a pirate around 1715. Um, he was born in 1960 something or nine, say 16, 16. 1689 yeah. actually. Um, so he was only 28 years old whenever he uh, captured the Widow pirate ship specifically. So we're going to get into a second, but let's, you know, I, I just, I, to do, every time we have you on, last time we had you on, you were speaking about the Golden State Killer, and I dive into your life, I dive into the work that you're doing, and I'm there for days. Like, this <laughs> life of pirates in the early 1700s, so that's like two or three generations before George Washington. It's mm -hmm. still the 13 colonies. It's still effective debt slavitude and servitude for many people in the 13 colonies. And these guys are preying on the slave ships and sometimes and quite often freeing the slaves. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that life of a pirate in those days. Well, the life of a pirate back then was, you know, quite a challenging job. People always thought that, and if you can consider it a job, um, people always thought that um, were fearful of pirates coming into their town whenever they made landfall, essentially. Um, and they were known to, you know, cause quite a disruption to villages and towns uh, going in and, and starting fights and being quite uh, vicious and violent. It sounds like a bunch of English football hooligans. <laughs> Me, exactly. You know, it's like nothing's changed. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. But Black Sam Bellamy was known for his mercy and his generosity towards those uh, places that he, uh, those ships that he captured and the people that he captured. Um, and what he was doing was trading a lot of these slaves for gold and silver and ivory and all the treasure essentially that he could possibly find. Um, so while he was the richest pirate of all time uh, and had a very short career as a pirate, um, I quite like the fact that he was known as the Robin Hood of the seas and he wasn't necessarily a terrible person that was out uh, uh, pillaging villages and, and murdering people. Yeah, and what I, what the other thing I like, particularly in this kind of generation that we're living in now, the one percent, you know, Amazon and all these guys making out like bandits in the middle of COVID, is that the the rate of pay for being a pirate captain was only mm -hmm. twice as much as being a regular exactly like member of the crew. I love yeah. that. I was reading about that also, and I was fascinated by that. And it, someone had said, you know, that's a good lesson to learn for today's CEOs and per, one percenters of um, the way the reason it was like that back in those days with those pirates was because the pirate ship captain would be fearful of retribution from his um, crew and they may overturn him and, and murder him to take more of the treasure if he is not going to give equal share. Yeah, and and you know, not to get into the one percenters, how they you know seal themselves off so they never mm -hmm. even talk to us. Anyway, okay, I've got to I got to pull that passion of mine down. <laughs> um, we'll do a whole series on corruption is normal on Crime Waves podcast coming down. How these guys have made their millions and billions from us. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about quote, and I know it's a kind of a cute twenty first century term, but but it really was true on these pirate ships of the multiculturalism. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, they were picking up slaves from Africa and bringing them across to the Caribbean uh, and then from the Caribbean up the east coast of the United States, um, picking up people in Maryland and moving on up into New England. Um, and so there was quite a range of people and quite a diverse selection of people on these pirate ships with the widow. And, and pirate sorry, ships. Yeah. And just to be clear. The pirates weren't the slavers. They were the guys capturing these slave ships, seizing exactly. them, and then saying to the slaves, so what do you want to do? Keep being yes. a slave? No, I want to be a pirate. Do you want to cool. work for us awesome. and get some money, or do you want to be sold into slavery in the U.S.? Yes. And so there was a massive number of, you know, there was a Swedish guy. There was a French guy. There was a Dutch guy. There was a bunch of English guys. There was um, uh, a whole bunch of uh benin former slaves from benin who are like this is cool i want to be a i want to be a sailor i want to like go in and make some cash and then there was also a mesquite or mosquito indigenous from honduras tell us a little bit about that that guy i 
Jacqueline, I don't really know much about that guy. Too. Great. I'm glad you said that because I do. <laughs> That's one of the questions that I like. Things. Anyway, these um, because so many of the pirates were in the Spanish main, which is in the Caribbean and around Central America, trying to pick off the Spanish um, gold ships. They would love to recruit indigenous mosquito um, men from Honduras because these guys were such fantastic sailors. They were such fantastic swimmers. They were such fantastic harpooners that mm -hmm. they said, if you get one of these guys to serve on your pirate ship, he feeds a hundred people. Like he, they're just brilliant. Yeah. So along with this other multicultural gang of people who were voting on and off, how do we attack? When do we attack? All this kind of like really floating, oddly floating democracies, you know, in 1700s terms, certainly much more than the societies that were ruling the 13 colonies and uh, Britain and other European powers at that time. Um, there was a fair amount of democracy there and they were using indigenous people and, and working well with indigenous people. And I wanna put that in our heads because what happens after the shipwreck? However, before we get to the shipwreck, tell us about, and I won't interrupt anymore, to, well, for a few minutes anyway, tell us about the Wida, what happens with that ship? So with the Wida pirate ship, or Wida, as the, the Massachusetts people call it, Thank you. Uh, with okay. their accent, um, in 1717, April 1717, um, Black Sam Bellamy had just captured the ship a couple of months previously uh, and had taken control of that ship and had actually the former owner of that ship or the former captain of the Wida ship, um, Black Sam actually gave that captain his own ship and said, here you go, I'll swap almost, <laughs> you know, so really again, proving how kind he was, he didn't want this person to be left out at sea stranded. Um, so in April 26th, uh, 1717, a big nor'easter came in and a big nor'easter took the pirate ship down. They couldn't um, sail it to shore quickly enough and it took the when pirate ship down. What's a nor'easter? You and I who are living now as transplanted Irish Canadians here, we know what a nor'easter, but just to, just tell our, our viewers and listeners from around the world, what's a nor'easter? It's basically a big storm that comes through okay. that is a very, very powerful storm. Uh, and it usually makes um, kind of uh, uh, hits the ocean right just before um, I'm just muddling up my words here. What am I trying to say? That's right. Winds of 70 miles an hour, rain hitting it, the shore. What, what I'm trying to say is the it, it rarely makes landfall. Ah, OK. That it's, it's what will happen on the coast, on the ocean. Uh, and nor'easters you rarely make landfall essentially Sorry, I did, I, I, thank you for I, I, I didn't actually know that because we've just gone through a series of um, really hard hitting tropical storms up here in the mm -hmm. northeast of Connecticut so I thought it would be one of those but mm -hmm. is that the reason why there was a dense bank of fog that Bellamy sailed his ship into this dense bank of fog and then suddenly the, the weather changes Yes, it's that's likely to be it. Um, but really, you know, how, how how will we ever truly know what the power of this storm actually was? Um, but it was big enough to take down the Widda ship, which at that time, the Widda ship was a state of the art um, a sailing ship. You know, this was the t Titanic, if you will, of the 17 of 1717. This ship was 300 tons in weight. Um, it was about 102 feet long um, and it had 18 cannon guns on it um, and it could travel up to speeds of 13 knots, which is about 24 kilometers per hour. So we obviously have much faster ships today. Um, but back then, this was a state of the art, very powerful, large ship um, that he had commanded. Had four and a half tons of gold, gold. And silver on mm, and ivory and other indigo other treasure that was there as well so you're adding that on to the other 300 tons that are already there as well um of, of just the ship's mechanics if, if if you will um so whenever it sunk it actually didn't you would think that it you know went down to the depths depths of the ocean like the titanic did but it actually sank in just about 14 feet of water um and was buried in about five feet of of sand i always compare whenever i'm talking about depths and uh, especially in feet i always compare my height i'm five foot five and i'm like wait so just my height 
is the amount of sand that was it was buried in under about you know 14 feet of water that's not very deep um so it was not that far off of the uh coastline that it actually sank uh but nevertheless it remained undiscovered for centuries love the story i'm just thinking i'm going to jump in because of i i you know i was talking a, a couple of minutes ago about the mosquito in uh, indigenous person he was one of the few people who survives this shipwreck mm -hmm. in april 7 10, 17. Mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. swims ashore in the midst of all this turmoil and he ends up being sold into slavery mm -hmm. the other surviving members of the pirate ship get hung but this mm -hmm. poor fellow gets get and 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 just to show the contrast um, between the life of a pirate and what awaited them on shore was he escaped constantly. He was a, a personal slave um, purportedly for one of the great grandfathers of John Quincy Adams, the president. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they called him Ju Julian the Indian. And he kept escaping. And finally, he murdered one of the bounty hunters who was coming after him to steal his freedom. So he killed him. And eventually catch him and they execute him so that just a, just a sense of that awful contrast mm -hmm. between this relatively free life as a pirate yes. and um you know the fate that awaited them on shore the ship is buried for 260 years mm -hmm. when do they discover it and who discovers this so there's a world renowned uh, dis explorer called Barry Clifford. Um, he's dedicated his entire life to treasure hunting and shipwreck hunting and discovering um, all of these shipwrecks all over the world. And it was in 1982 that the Widda ship was first discovered. Now they weren't certain whether they had the Widda ship, right? So it took them many, many years. Well, not many, it took them a few years to actually confirm um, that it was indeed the Widda pirate ship. So discovered in 82, they spent about two years going down every summer, scuba diving down um, to the shipwreck, recovering artifacts from it. And then it was in 84 when it was confirmed that this was indeed the Widda pirate ship, the Widda ship. Um, and it was actually the first uh, documented pirate shipwreck uh, or confirmed authenticated pirate shipwreck ever to be discovered um, uh, in the United States and Northern America. Um, wow. So it was quite a where, big discovery. Where was this discovery? Where, what, what Off the coast of, the of Cape Cod in the Wellfleet area. It's now known as Wellfleet. Um, okay. And it's a great place to visit as well. There's the Widda Pirate Ship Museum there. So if you're ever up that direction, I would definitely recommend popping in there. They also have a, a smaller museum in Provincetown, Massachusetts, uh, in yep. the Macmillan Wharf area, where they have uh, quite a lot of the artifacts there that you can go and see that have been recovered. Um, but yeah, so Barry Clifford discovered it in 82, authenticated in 84. In 85, they found that galley with the with the bell that has Widda pirate ship engraved on it. Oh, so that wow. was the real confirmation of we actually have the Widda pirate ship here right now. Um, and so since then, since 1985, um, they've been going down every summer because you can only go down in the summertime when the waters are clear. Um, and they go down every summer and they it's a huge excavation, essentially, because this was an extremely large ship, um, you know, 102 feet long. So it's, it's a lot of a, uh, it's a lot of stuff to ask, excavate. Um, but they've been going down every summer since 1985 or four um, and recovering artifacts. Essentially, what has happened over these 300 years is, as you can imagine, with the sand and the dirt and the silt and the salt and everything breaking down, the, the, the actual structure of the ship breaking down over the years, it all amalgamates into this what we call concretions. They're like big, huge boulders, massive boulders. Um, and it all kind of fuses together. So it's not as simple as just go down and pick up some bits of debris and bring them up. It's a huge excavation of, of lifting these very, very heavy concretions out of the water, bringing them to land, getting them into the museum. And they have them hung on these nets, essentially, these very strong um, uh, net platforms that they have in the Widow Pirate Ship Museum um, that you can go and actually see for yourself as well. Um, and then they chip so, away at those methodically. So is it kind of like, you know, as a Canadian, is it kind of like a snowball? 
like uh, you roll the snowball up and you get all the debris that's collected no, in it? Is they're it not really you know um circular in nature either they're just like big boulders big massive blocks that have fused together so you might have pieces of wood a bunch of sand yeah. some shoes treasure some whatever just... <laughs> And I mean, have they discovered treasure there? Oh, they've I mean, discovered they recover- huge amounts of treasure. Millions of dollars of treasure has been recovered. Millions of thousands of millions of dollars worth of um, artifacts ranging from the guns can be artifacts to jewelry, to bracelets, to um, gold, to ivory, everything. Um, and actually quite interestingly for the last six years or so, um a portion because they've recovered over two hundred thousand artifacts from the shipwreck so far and there's more to come um uh, a portion of those two hundred thousand artifacts that they have recovered is actually on tour around the us uh that's being sponsored by the national Ge- geographic society so there may be a a tour of the widow pirate ship artifacts coming to a town near you soon so take a look oh, yeah. at google and see <laughs> brilliant now we've got this shipwreck we've got it found we've got all this gold we've got all this thing how does a brilliant forensic investigator like you who (laughs) mostly frankly does work on criminal cases Mm -hmm. how do you get involved with this pirate ship well um it's quite a serendipitous way really um i'm working for the university of new haven and in particular within the henry c lee college of criminal yes. justice and forensic sciences uh, plug there well done colleague yes <laughs> we're very well known right for the forensic work we do and in particular myself and my colleagues in my department that are focused on dna and genetic analysis um we're kind of a go-to group right to go to if especially up in the northeast up here in new england um of if they have a question and especially something related to dna that's going to we're going to be the people that they'll go to but with this particular one there's um a um investigative journalist and, and writer um casey sherman who uh, my boss, uh, Professor Timothy Palmback, had previously worked with on the Boston Strong- Strangler investigation. And Casey Sherman is from the area where the widow pirate ship uh, is located and had grown up hearing about this story throughout his entire childhood and was always fascinated by it. And so he's become involved in kind of the excavation and recovery and telling the story of the Wida pirate ship over the last few years. Uh, and so he reached out to Professor Palmback, um, uh, asking him, could you help us with this investigation this, uh, and, and help us with putting the pieces of the puzzle back together from this uh, pirate ship investigation? And they asked us specifically because this was back in February 2018. Um, So just three years ago at this point, uh, they had come across while digging through um, a concretion, their first ever human bone from all of their excavations. What? So they've been digging and recovering Mm -hmm. these boulders for 34 years Mm -hmm. and they finally get a bone. Yeah. They finally get the first bone. And and by the way, in the shipwreck, hundreds of people have died. I mean, this is a a real equivalent. I love your, your image of the Titanic, you know. Over 100 people have died. So what happened? I mean, and, and now they phone you or they phone Tim Palmback, who's been on this program, who will come back to talk about the Boston Strangler case. And I'm just going to put a plug because Claire Ginn's being very modest. The forensics department here at the University of New Haven was founded by the man who was effectively the first pioneer of linking DNA with detective work. So they are absolutely world leaders in this field. Um, Claire. Tell us about the bone. Tell us a little bit more about this. Well, with this, um, one thing to kind of note is that the Widow Pirate Ship had a crew of 146 people, uh, but 102 bodies washed ashore. So with the shipwreck, we're only expecting to find maybe 46 bodies, perhaps, because there may have been others that would have washed ashore, but just simply were never found or sharks had some dinner, you know, for themselves. Right. Um, so whenever they came across the very first human bone, it was essentially they were chipping away at one of these big concretions. And as they're chipping away, they come across uh, a very intricate pistol that's wrapped with a pink sash. 
And this intricate pistol could have only belonged to the pirate ship captain. A regular crew member wouldn't have had such a delicate and intricate pistol. So, of course, they got very excited at this discovery and finding such a monumentous piece of um, uh, history uh, as they're digging through this concretion. And then directly to the left of it, as they started chipping away, they see this bone start to emerge as they're chipping away at the concretion. Um, and I'm sure at first they were like, is it a bone? Is it a piece of wood? What could this be? Uh, and as they chip and chip away, uh, it becomes a much clearer that this is indeed a human bone. Uh, and so they brought some specialists in at that time to um, some archaeology specialists that have experience with recovery of human remains and ancient remains. Um, and they confirmed that this was indeed a human bone and it was indeed a femur um, of this, of, of a human. So that's when they called us and they said, right, well, what could we do with this bone from a DNA perspective? Think about where we are today with our ability to DNA profile almost anything. Right. And, right. and, uh, and we've but, known but you've got that, you've got a, a, a leg bone. Yes. It's not only been buried in sand for hundreds of years, it's been kind of, you know, mucked up and, yeah. and, and put around in, the, in my, you know, the boulder, the snowball. Yes. So when do you, Claire Glynn, first see that bone? Um, so it was later in the month of February, uh, myself, Professor Palmback, and my excellent colleague, Dr. David San Pietro, we went up to the Widow Pirate Ship Museum where the big concretion was on the big platform, the netted platform, um, and it was still housed within the concretion. Uh, and there was a big... I, I, I just want to add, because what you've just said, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, Claire, but right. these are three top level criminal investigators. Mm-hmm. David, Tim, and you, uh, you know, you, you know, you, you've done so many murder cases, you've done so many homicides, you've done things, and here you are going back in time mm-hmm. to investigate this pirate ship wreck. Okay, sorry, keep cracking. <laughs> yeah. And no, that, that's perfect because it's exactly what I love about my job is the variability and diversity that I have yes. within it. It's not just homicides or sexual assaults that we're investigating regularly. It can also be things like this that is going back 300 years in time and telling a story and documenting and helping history. Because in order to know where we can go in the future, we have to know where we came from in the past. And so uncovering secrets and stories like this is part of making history. Uh, and I'm just delighted and honored to be a part of it. It's brilliant. Okay, so you're, you're standing in front of this boulder of 300 years of history and sand yes. and legend wrapped up. What are you thinking at that moment? Um, well, it was quite an exciting time because there was uh, a lot of uh, news outlets there. There were a lot of, uh, we were having a big press conference. And also it was an honor to meet both Casey Sherman and also um, Barry Clifford, you know, with these esteemed uh, and world recognized explorers and investigators. Um, so we were there exactly as the archaeologists were chipping away the final piece of the concretion. And then she pulled it out of the concretion and handed it over to Barry Clifford first, because we thought he should have the, the honor of holding the bone for the first time. Um, and then we laid it out on some sterile surface uh, and we started to photograph it. Then we wrapped it up very carefully, um, brought it back with us, back to our uh, uh, DNA laboratory here at the University of New Haven, and we started working on it. Let me, let me ask you, Claire, uh, you know, before we get into what you were doing and how you were doing it, you know, we're talking about a mystery, but I don't want to, I don't want to get carried away by my own excitement here. We're also talking about a human life, a human mm-hmm. bone. How do you treat that? How, you know, what is well, the protocol? With, it's, it's from my personal perspective, it is you treat it like it's your family member. Like this is a human being. Yes, they may have may have been a pirate 300 years ago, but it's a human being nonetheless. Uh, and so you treat it with the utmost respect and the utmost dignity. Uh, you handle it very carefully. You wrap it very carefully and you transport it very carefully. We have to do that from all, a human perspective of this is another human being and this is their remains. And this is a family member of somebody and may have living descendants still today. 
Um, but also from a scientific perspective, I have to treat it very carefully because I don't want to further damage the bone. I don't want to further degrade it. I don't want to contaminate it with uh, my own DNA or anybody else's DNA. So it's a very careful process that we follow. What are you trying to do or what were you trying to do at that point? At so at that point, um, the first thing we had to do is get it back to the lab. Uh, and this was very exciting um, and bringing it into the lab. And we made sure our lab was completely sterilized beforehand. Um, and then with that actual bone, it still had a quite a bit of concretion attached to it. Lots of it was like this dark material that could be anything. It's sand, silt, everything fused together. Uh, and in a way, Clothing. it looked. Yes. Um, in a way, it almost <laughs> looked like the bone had been burned. It had this almost charring effect on it. Um, and that could be a result of many different chemical reactions that could have been occurring over the 300 years. Um, but what we had to do was spend quite a lot of time sanding the bone down and sanding all of that upper surface debris and also contaminants off of the surface of the bone. It's a quite a long, laborious um, task and you need to be wearing masks and be in a fume hood because that sand and everything kind of filters up into the air. Um, and so once we got the bone down to what looks like an actual bone, you know, that whitish color and, and that exterior, hard exterior, our job then is to get and remove a usable quantity and quality of DNA so that we can actually do some analysis of that DNA. Now, how difficult, I mean, how difficult it is to get a piece of DNA or, you know, that you can do an analysis mm -hmm. after 300 years of tides and oceans yes. and sand and, and all this other stuff there. Well, DNA degrades quite rapidly. Um, you know, once a person dies uh, and the body begins to decompose, whether it's at the bottom of the ocean or, or outside in a field, uh, it, the process can, um, can follow kind of the same steps. But the DNA starts to degrade almost immediately because of the exposure to bacteria and the bacteria is eating away at that. But then also think about it being exposed to the elements and that can speed up the process, but it can also kind of freeze it in time as well. So the elements being environmental insults, we call them like heat, humidity, yes. moisture, um, all of that can have an impact on the DNA. So we were quite nervous to begin with. Um, and we were cautiously optimistic uh, that we would get a, a good quality and quantity of DNA. But we were also, you know, very self-aware that we may not get any usable amount of DNA from this. So now, we have to refine you, our methods. What are you trying to do when you get the DNA from this bone? So once you get DNA from the bone, you need to first assess how much you got and then what yes. quality it is in. So how broken down is it? You and I have talked before about um, your genetic code and it's this 3.5 billion base pairs of information. When DNA degrades, you're gonna lose sequences and segments of that genetic code over time because they just break away and they break down. Right, but what's, what's the goal of the whole investigation? What are you trying to do here? So um, over in Devon in England, there is a known living descendant of Black Sam Bellamy. Um, yes. <laughs> so they're, they've traced their family lineage, you know, uh, where this uh, family line has come from. And Black Sam had a, a, bro a couple of brothers. And so this was a known living descendant of one of those brothers. It is speculated that um, Black Sam Bellamy had a wife and children somewhere in England at some point before he captured the Witta Pirate Ship, but that's never been confirmed. Um, but this other individual is a known uh, living descendant of the Bellamy fa uh, family. And so with so that... You're, you're trying to figure out whether that bone was actually the leg of Black Sam Bellamy. Of Black Sam Bellamy, exactly. Um, and so what we wanted to do was confirm the DNA profile that we're able to extract from the bone and com uh, compare that to the known living descendant over in England. So we sent him some swabs. We said, can you swab the inside of your mouth to get those cheek cells, nice, strong, healthy collection. Uh, and he sent them back to us and we performed what we call YSTR profiling. Incredible. So, Before we get into the YSDR profile, let's take a quick step back into this whole amazing field of 
of forensic genealogy, because that's what we're, we're now right in the middle of is like, hey, does this bone belong to that, that person who's mm -hmm. related to it somehow? Mm -hmm. And this has revolutionized investigations in all kinds of ways. Can you tell our, our listeners and viewers a little bit about that, please? Yeah, sure. So with forensic genetic genealogy, genetic genealogy itself has been around for 21 years. The first commercial DNA kit for tracing family heritage came out in 2000. So we've had it for 21 years and amateur and also professional genealogists started adding this new tool to their arsenal uh, for confirming familial relationships or family relationships and building back people's histories over time. But it wasn't used um, uh, in forensic uh, uh, investigations until just about three years ago when it really kind of exploded into forensic investigations. Um, and the first kind of high profile one that got the most media um, attention was the uh, case of the Golden State Killer, where basically they, have, we've, we've spoken, spoken about, about before. before. Yeah. And basically it's uh, taking a crime scene DNA sample and we profile it in a specific way, looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms. So that's and, hair, sperm, spit. They've yeah, any something. biological sample that can produce autosomal DNA. Um, and with that, you can, in a typical criminal investigation today, not a historical investigation, if we have a crime scene DNA sample and we snip yes. profile it and we can take that data and then we can upload that to a public online genealogy database, genetic genealogy database, the most common one being um, GEDmatch. And in there, basically what's happening is you're comparing your DNA profile from your crime scene sample to everyone else that has opted into this database and comparing the DNA to each other. The, the system does it for you. You don't have to do it, thankfully. And it's looking for shared amounts of DNA because you share a certain amount of DNA with all of your genetic relatives, everyone that's in your family lineage. Think of your family tree and how the branches go up, but then they also go out. Think of your first, your fourth cousins, your fifth cousins, your yes. sixth cousins, your great, 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 great grandparents, great, 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 great grand uncles. Um, you so share golden, DNA with all of those. In, and in the Golden State Killer case, they had an exultant piece of biological material left by this scumbag serial rapist and murderer mm -hmm. and they were able to link that back with you know a, 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 not a particularly close relative but but suddenly yeah. it went from being an unknown killer um, alone among 40 million people in california mm -hmm. to hey here's a sampling size of 30 people yes or 300 people or something so it just cuts it down, has, it cuts is, it down i mean yeah. it, has that changed you know, and we're going to get back to Black Sam Bellamy in a second, because I know our people are all waiting to hear the results. I'm waiting to hear the results. But has this changed investigations? I mean, it has uh, it has certainly revolutionized what we can do um, yes. with uh, DNA and with genetic material. Um, it I, I would never want to say that it's uh, replacing what we currently do or what we did before, it's enhancing what we do before. It's complementary to what we do before. Um, if you think about forensic DNA profiling as in the traditional form of forensic DNA profiling that we've had for 30 plus years uh, and the amount of cases that that has helped solve, that was yes. truly you know, revolutionized what we can do in criminal investigations and has become the gold standard in forensic investigations. In a crime today, or even looking at a cold case investigation, um, all of those cases still have to go through the forensic DNA profiling process, the one we've been using for 30 plus years. And it's only once it hits a dead end that we've got nowhere else we can go, that we need to be able to identify who this perpetrator is. Um, it's only then that forensic genetic genealogy is employed. Um, and it has really blasted open cases here in the US, cold case investigations, cases that perhaps would have never been solved without the use of forensic genetic genealogy. And we're stuck on numbers at the moment because we don't have a clear idea of just how many cases have been worked with forensic genetic genealogy in the last three years. But it's estimated that about 500 cases have been solved through the use of forensic genetic genealogy in just the last three years. 
And you, you, and I note as well that you're being quite modest about this. Um, you're actually heading up a center now here at the University of New Haven and a certificate in, in, in teaching investigators, forensic investigators, these new techniques. Tell us a little bit about that, please. So we don't quite have the center just yet, but we have the graduate just certificate it's just yet. There. Uh, we have the, the graduate certificate in forensic genetic genealogy, um, and this is the first program of its kind ever, um, you know, globally. Um, so really, I saw that there was a huge gap in knowledge and training in this area. And we had such a huge amount of people wanting to help and wanting to use their genealogy skills uh, to help solve these cold case investigations that I thought, okay, well, I'm seeing a lot of misinformation out there and uh, what types of tools we use and how to solve these cases using genetic genealogy. And so I said, we need to get an educational program um, structured uh, and available to people who want to learn more about this uh, new field. And it has been wildly successful. We just finished our first cohort of the program uh, just a couple of weeks ago. I had about 30 students enrolled for the yes. first uh, first uh, inaugural cohort of it. And it truly, I could, it, it couldn't have been a better experience for both me and for the students. This is quite a, a unique um, mix of people. These are uh, mostly um, uh, adult learners. The average age yes. was 45. Uh, all people returning to school to learn specifically about this. And this is uh, law enforcement professionals, crime lab professionals, uh, death investigators, scene of crime technicians, um, and then also uh, a, another segment, another um, portion of the students in the program were not affiliated with law enforcement in any way, but were amateur genealogists and just had a passion for this. And what they did, because the last course in the program, it's a four course program, is the practicum. And in that, you either get a mock case that I'll give you and your job is to go out and solve the case. Um, or we had partnered with some of our great and amazing uh, industry partners, such as the DNA Doe Project and also Bodhi Technology. Um, and so we had several students volunteer with the DNA Doe Project, who is a, a, a terrific organization that dedicate themselves to um, identifying unidentified human remains or as is more casually known Jane and John Doe's um, and my students actually in their practicum and in through this internship with the DNA Doe project they uh, uh, identified a Jane Doe who had been unidentified since 2017. Brilliant brilliant look um uh, again our viewers can't see this but my students who are producing this are you know they're basically signing up for your courses now i mean it's just excellent it, you know you know it, it's the ground floor of this extraordinary new technology mm -hmm. we're mm -hmm. going to have you back in again because we talked a little bit about the issues around it the moral issues mm -hmm. around it when we talked to golden state killer but everybody wants to know mm -hmm. black sam bellamy you run the experiment you've got the swab of the DNA from his direct male descendant in Devon, England, come back. What happens? Was that so, done, Black Sam? It was, uh, and this is a lesson to all scientists out there. Don't look at the results of your experiment on a Friday afternoon just before the weekend. Give it the weekend and hopefully have a nice surprise on Monday morning. But unfortunately, I did look at my results uh, from I, the. Uh, I, you can't be blamed for that. That's like <laughs> you're trying to not open your Christmas presents until exactly. New Year's Day. It's just yeah. So yeah, it was a mid Friday afternoon, um, uh, sometime in mid 2018, uh, and we had the DNA profile, the YSTR profile of the bone. And now we had the YSTR profile of our known living descendant in Devon in England, and they weren't even closely a match. So with, with the Y chromosomal profile, you will share the same Y chromosomal profile with every male in your family. Um, and so that's what we were looking for. They need to match to say that they came from the same familial lineage. Now, that's not to say that the bone does not belong to Black Sam Bellamy. We can't say that because with this known living descendant in um, uh, Devon in England, he may be a known living descendant based on paper and, and paper trail uh, and, and uh, documentary evidence for all those 300 years. 
But from a genetic standpoint, there could have been a break in that lineage at some point over 300 years. And by a break in the lineage, the genetic lineage, I mean that someone's father may not be their father or someone may have been adopted. Adopted And that's how the genetic lineage can be broken over time. So I can't say that it's not Black Sam Bellamy, uh, but I can't say that it is either. Very disappointing. (laughs) Um, Where does the... uh... Black Sam Bellamy wide investigation go from here. I understand that there were six full skeletons uh, Mm -hmm. discovered. So are you carrying on with this work? Yes, we've been eagerly eagerly anticipating um, receiving these six full skeletons that were found in February of this year, February 21. Um, They are located in the concretions still. So they x-ray these big, huge concretions. And that's how they identified we have skeletons housed within some of these uh, concretions. And they estimated to be about six uh, skeletons. And they said that um, they look to be almost complete, you know, so um, that's really good to hear. Um, And so we're just waiting on the go ahead that they have gotten to the point where they can remove them from the concretions. And then I'll be straight on the highway and up to Wellfleet in Massachusetts, up to Cape Cod to recover them and bring them back to our lab and essentially do the same as what we did in 2018 with. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, I'll come with you. Yes, of course. But but Um, your your challenge now is you've got, I mean, just a quick poll sample. You've got you've got people from Honduras, you know, the Mesquite mm -hmm. indigenous, you've got the Swedes, you've got the Mm -hmm. French. You've got the Dutch, you've got somebody from Eastern Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. You've also got people from Africa Mm -hmm. on that ship. So the whole international collaboration you're going to have to build to identify these six skeletons is going to be massive and fascinating. It will certainly be a challenge as well. What we'll do with the new skeletons that we receive, um, we'll do what we did in 2018 with the femur bone, where we'll do the YSTR profiling of them if we get usable quantity and quality of DNA, of course. Um, but I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we will. Um, and we'll do the YSTR profiling. The YSTR profiling can give us some information as to that individual's biogeographic ancestry. Um, and we'll, of course, compare it to the YSTR profile of our known living descendant in Devon. Um, but we're going to take it an ev- a step further um, this time around, because now we have a lot more skill and knowledge uh, and training in forensic genetic genealogy. So with that, what I want to do with these bones is get uh, perform whole genome sequencing. So with this type of whole genome sequencing, it's with the YSTR profiling, you're only looking at particular segments along the DNA. Right. With whole genome sequencing, it's exactly how it sounds. You're sequencing the entire genome. Now we're expecting it to be degraded. So there's going to be portions missing, but still it's going to gather us a lot more and generate a lot more data for us to work from. With the data that we generate from that whole genome sequencing, we'll then upload it to a public online genetic genealogy database like uh, GEDmatch, hopefully. Um, And in there, we'll be looking for people that share DNA with our bones. No, so so suddenly somebody could get a call out of the blue mm -hmm. and say, by the way, (laughs) your great, 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 great uncle or aunt, because there were women on the ship as well, was, wow. Yeah. Clear Glenn. Thank you so much for coming to this program. Thank you again for the work that you do. And as well, I think, thank you for the, the way you treat the bones mm-hmm. in your in your presence and stuff. I, 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 I think myself and the listeners and viewers are really appreciative of that mm-hmm. respect that you and the team shows. Well, thank you. And thank you for having me here. And I can't wait to update you once we get our hands on those skeletons again. Done, done, <laughs> done and dusted. Thank you again, Claire. Thank you, bye. Hey, it's Declan. Thank you so much for listening to The Search for Black Sam with Professor Claire Glynn from the University of New Haven Center for Forensic Genealogy. Check it out on the website. It's an extraordinary center, extraordinary skill, which is solving cold cases after decades. For the rest, if you like this particular episode, please do like us on social media and follow us. And we'll see you all next week for another episode of Crime Waves Podcast.